Today, we jump into the power of agreement. What does it mean to agree with one another in prayer? If you think about it, we're bombarded with a lot of decisions today. I mean, you go out and get fast food, and you're asked about half a dozen questions. You know, you want this, you don't want that, you want this, and you're like, your brain is fried, and you haven't even got your food yet because you're answering so many questions. And uh, I tell you what, we live in a society where we're just bombarded with all kinds of options and questions all the time. And, and sometimes we think, how do we get into agreement together? Even when we come into the church and we begin making decisions or we begin praying about something. And it's just a lot of opinions that are floating around. How do we get into agreement together because we know that God answers the prayer of agreement? We call it the prayer of faith, but really... The prayer of faith is all about the prayer of agreement. And when that happens, there's an order to it. First of all, we have to get in agreement with God and his will. And then we get in agreement with one another. And then God answers that prayer. It's just that simple. Now, there's other things that, that, are, uh, that, that sometimes come in that don't allow that process to flow as, as clearly and as simply as I've just explained. Because we're all in, all in process. So we get that. But we're all bombarded with, with decisions. And I begin to think about uh, what, what, what are the aspects or what are the things that, that we need to address in order to get into agreement with God and with one another. And uh, some of the things I, I came up with was, uh, was, first of all, what we believe, our theology about God and about uh, you know, who, uh, what he believes about us and his plan for our life. Sometimes that takes a while to figure out. And when you come into agreement, if you're not, uh, you know, close to the same page, it can be challenging because people are believing different theology about things. I, I never forget uh, one of my seminary professors made this statement. He said that theology is not theology unless it's prayed. I thought, wow, that's a that's an incredible statement because most of the time when people discuss theology, they're dissecting it and they're dividing over it and they're, 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 uh, you know, they're, they're giving each other's opinion about it. But his statement was simply this, it's not theology until it's been prayed. And lots of times what we believe doesn't get prayed. It gets argued over and it gets defended and yet it doesn't get prayed. And yet I believe if we would do that, the Lord would bring us into agreement with his will and, and with one another. You know, another th aspect I thought about is our motives. Why do we want an answered prayer? Sometimes it's for our own convenience. It would be more convenient if God would answer that prayer. Do you think that's what he has in mind? Probably not, always. Sometimes maybe he's, he's always for our, our help, but not for our convenience. It's for his glory that he wants answered prayer. And also, I thought about including others in and, 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 and the process of including others. Maybe it's your spouse getting in agreement with, with he or she. Maybe it's uh, the family getting in agreement with a family, with children and parents. It takes time. It takes work. Jesus said one time, he said that to, to believe is the work of God. That's an interesting statement. He said to believe is the work of God. In other words, it takes work to believe. It takes work to get into agreement uh, together. And then I thought about sometimes we pray prayers that uh, can't be measured. Like, how, how do you measure? God saved the world. <laughs> Great prayer, right? But how do you measure that one? How do you know when it's done? How do you know when it's in process? Versus God saved my sister, or God saved my brother, or God saved my uncle. You can measure that one because you're going to know when your sister, your uncle, your brother gets saved, right? But how do, you, how do you, you know, measure the one? God saved the world. And obviously he wants to do that. But I think that sometimes that to get into agreement, we've got to have something we can measure together to know when God says it's answered. And the final thing I thought about is, is that, um, that in order to, to uh, get into uh, uh, agreement together, we have to have God's will and our will. It's been spoken. Nick mentioned it as he closed out service today. And they have to match together. They have to mix in together. So this is some things that I was, that I was uh, processing when I talk about the prayer of agreement. All the factors that have to be looked at and to come together. I'm going to read some scripture here starting out. Just three groups of scripture that talk about agreement. 
And we're going to start in Matthew 18, just two verses, 19 and 20. And Jesus said to this, he said, Again, truly I say to you that if two of you on earth would agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus makes this bold statement. Now really it's in the context of getting sin out of the church. That's the context. Because earlier, just a, a few verses earlier, he says that if, if somebody has a, a odds against the other person, that first of all you go to that person yourself. And if they don't listen, if they don't, if they don't acknowledge that something's wrong, then you take another person with you. So you go the second and to the same person and talk it out. If that doesn't work, then you go to a group. It says the church, but it's really a small group. You go to the church and you see, again, if that thing can get worked out, get agreement, can be made. And if that doesn't work, Jesus says you treat them as a sinner and a tax collector. What is that? Uh, one of my former pastors told me what that meant, and I, I, I've used it ever since. When, if you get to that place where you've gone through three levels of trying to get in agreement with God, and they still don't want to cooperate, then you treat them as a sinner and a tax collector, collector, which means you love them, but you don't solve their problem because they don't want their problem solved. So you just love them, but you don't solve their problem because they don't want it solved. They've had three chances. And they're like, I don't want this problem solved. So you just love them and don't solve their problem. And it helps a lot when we have that, that understanding. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 reads, This is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Wow. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? But it's based upon one thing. If we know what we ask is according to his will, we've got to discover what his will is. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a few moments. And then the last one I want to just mention is Amos 3.3. 3. It's oftentimes read or, or, or said at weddings. It says, if two people, would, uh, two people will not walk together unless they have first agreed to do so. I liken that the old sack race. You, you remember that one where you put, uh, you know, two legs of, uh, uh, you take two people and two legs in the sack and the other two legs and you have to run the race, right? If you're not uh, in cooperation together, you will end up on the ground. It just doesn't work any other way. And so God uh, uses that example that uh, how can we walk together at least we, unless we agree? Let's jump in today in the outline. God answers prayer that agree with him and each other. God answers prayer that agrees with him and each other. And I want to just uh, kind of highlight here Matthew 18, 19, where it says, if two of you on earth would agree. It starts out and says, if. That's a, that's a conditional word. That, that word, if, means that we have a choice to make. If. And if we don't make a choice in accordance with God's will or to get agreement with others, then we'll be in disagreement and what we want won't happen because we've not made the choice of if. And lots of times we, we, you know, we'd like to make uh, choices for people for them, especially in a marriage or a family situation. We'd like to make the decision. But this word says if, meaning you have to, as an individual, decide that you want God's will in the matter. And if you don't, you'll be in disagreement. You'll be in disagreement with God and also the others around you that want God's will. So we have to decide. The second uh, word there that pops out to me is the word agree. Those of you that have uh, studied into this a little bit, you, the, the word in Greek is, is uh, symphony or symphéo, which where we get the word symphony. And uh, actually coming out of that in a symphony, you have harmonies. And so God is not just looking for unity. He's looking for harmony. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, you know, maybe you learn, know how to sing or you appreciate good song, but you can sing a song in unity or you can sing it in harmony. And there's a difference. What would you like to listen to? God says the word agree is harmony, not just unity. 
In fact, I found this video of the difference between harmony and unity. I mean, uh, 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 unison and harmony. So let's just take a listen, uh, a look, or listen rather. You can look too. But let's take a listen and see which would we like to listen to. Let's. Uh, and just, uh, and just um, wanted to demonstrate a little bit of the difference between unison and harmony with Beyond Steels and my sister Robin. So we're just going to check it out and you guys show us what it's about. Okay. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Now we're going to harmony. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. That is beautiful, man. I feel like I should go to church. The difference between unison and harmony. God says, I want harmony in my agreement. There's a difference, isn't it? Yeah. So as we look at um, coming into agreement with God and each other, really there's several things, and maybe we could call this three-part harmony here at this point. But as we uh, look at, first of all, we need to understand his will in the matter. What is God's will in this matter? 1 John 5, 14 and 15. I read earlier. Let me just read it again. This is the confidence that we have according to God's will. That if you ask, according to God, that if you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Again, it's based upon God's will. And what I've noticed is that everything that we face in life, in this life, everything that we face, there is a basic God's will in everything. Let me just, just run through a few examples and talk to you about, about God's will. That is that uh, God would desire that everyone come to a knowledge of him being their savior. That's God's will. He would want everyone to be saved. Now, will everyone get saved? Probably not. Does he want everybody? Yes, he does. But basically, that's God's will. God would have no one. He would desire no one to be separated from him. That's God's will. It's basic on that. Here's another one. God's will is that one man and one woman would be married for their life. That's God's will. That's God's basic will. Does it, always, <clears throat> excuse me, does it always turn out that way? No, it doesn't. And it doesn't mean that people can't get back into God's will after that happens, but that's God's basic will in marriage. One man would be married to one woman for their life. That's God's will. There's a lot of factors, again, uh, staying in that and coming into that. Here's another one, that we train up a child in the way that they would go, and when they get older, they won't depart from it. That's God's basic will, that parents would train their children how to be a success in life, to know the Lord, and, and to live, and, and, um, and have the opportunities that come their way and, and be a success in that. Here's another one. God's basic will is that we would love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. That's God's will. In fact, if you do the first part, you'll have no trouble doing the second part. You try to do the second part, loving our neighbors, ourselves, without doing the first part, you're going to end up in a lot of disagreements. You say, well, how is that done? We'll just read the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments really unfolds those two commands. Uh, part of them is loving God and part of the ten is loving one another, how we love one another according to God's will. And so there's all, there's, I mean, God has his will for, for healing and getting free. And, 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 and uh, God has his, his will for finances and how that would operate in our life. So God has a basic will uh, upon all of life. And then, and then once you understand that, you work towards it to come into agreement with what he has in mind. So how do we figure that out? We, we use his word. And, and that's the starting place. We have a spirit that again interprets things individually sometimes, but, but his word has a lot of, of great truth that we, can, that we can search out and know. Wanda's in the process of writing a book where she is taking her journal that she started as a teenager and up to her adult years 
and she wanted to know God's will in a whole bunch of different topics of life. And so she just went and, and said a topic of like finances or healing or relationships. And she went and listed all the scriptures she could find in the Bible relating to that topic. And then a prayer at the bottom. So that's going to come out in the fall. But she's pretty excited about it because the whole book is basically settling God's will about a certain life topic that we deal with. And it's important for us to, to know in order to get into agreement and know how to pray. So we're looking at, uh, at God's word. And God's word today is, is kind of under attack, if you hadn't noticed. I mean, there's people that question God's word. Even, you know, I'm hearing little rumblings about translations that are coming up and, and, and whether or not you can trust this translation and what about this translation and what about this. And, you know, uh, translations, really, if you stick with, with basic core translations, you can trust them. You have to make a decision to do that. All of us are not going to learn Greek or Hebrew in order to go back to the original. We trust the translation that has been given us. And I recommend I use the NIV. My wife loves the, the uh, English Standard Version, the ESV. The New King James is good as well as American Standard. Those are just good translations of the Bible. But the challenge of a translation is that you want to capture the accuracy, but also give meaning. In other words, that's the tension that happens in a translation. Even if I would go to another nation, and I would be speaking in English, and the translator would be translating what I'm saying, he or she that's translating the language would be thinking, trying to keep the accuracy of what I'm saying, but also giving meaning to the culture that I'm speaking to. And sometimes that gets into a jam. Because my culture and that culture doesn't have the same word that I'm using or concept that I'm using. They just don't have it. And so it puts the translator in attention when this culture is trying to speak to that culture. And, and what I'm saying isn't going to translate. And so what about that? Well, again, sometimes the translators then go to meaning. They, they use maybe uh, different words or maybe a cluster of words to try to convey something that in the Greek it may have been one word and the Greeks know what that means. But when it's translated into English, it's different. It's, it has to be a concept. And so we walk through this tension between accuracy and translation. In other words, if I would, if I would take the Greek and I would translate it accurately, word for word, into the the English language, you would have no idea what he's saying when I'm done. It wouldn't make any sense. It would be entirely accurate because I would take that Greek word and English and that and this. But you get done, like, what does it mean? Who knows? And so it has to be configured according to the language that we're in in order for it to have meaning. And God wants it to have meaning as well as being, being accurate. So as we look at, at God's word, it's important that we understand that uh, we can trust it. Let's jump into agreement together. What does it mean uh, in this three-part part harmony here? Uh, what does it mean? God's, God's word, God's will, and then uh, our agreement uh, together. As I, as I know, but we, we recognize that God is God, and he's sovereign, and, and he's our father, and he can make the ultimate decision. And so, um, but he was, he was comparing the difference between his wife that passed away I don't know, maybe five years ago, and, and now his daughter. And he said it was extremely more difficult when his wife passed away because he was in a setting where, where it, it, people were just not open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in this setting, when his daughter was passing away, he was in our congregation where his small group and several small groups were around supporting him, and they were open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So God was like through his spirit flowing through encouragement and, and change and, and hope and, and all this. And he said it was so much easier going through this one, even though the, it's challenging as it was, you know, bearing a man bearing his daughter, that's huge challenge. He said it was a lot easier going through this one than it was my wife when the gifts weren't active. I'm like, wow, that's amazing insight. And so coming into agreement with God, he's given us gifts of the Holy Spirit in order for us to agree fuller, not just be in unison, but to be in harmony together. And that's what he loves. He loves, loves the harmony of our prayers. When, when you, you're in a group of, of praying together, you know, you, you oftentimes have maybe one topic, but then 
everybody that's praying will see different aspects of that topic. And that's the beauty. That when you get done, you say, okay, what is God actually saying here? Let's get into agreement about it. Like, for instance, if I needed a car. Okay, Bobby needs a car. Bring five people together. And we start praying, and one person's going to pray, do you have the money? You know, oh, I don't know if I have the money. Okay, God, release the money so I can buy a car. Then somebody else will say, uh, you know, uh, God, give him the car that he really needs, that you want for him. And somebody else will pray, um, can you fix the old car? No, the old car's gone, you know. And somebody else will pray, I saw a car down the street, and maybe that's one's for you. So all these aspects are coming together for not just, Bobby needs a car. Okay, he needs a car. Done. Well, that's boring. No, let's pray into it with the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God could then fill up that so we can uh, decide together what the Lord is saying. That's harmony uh, together. And so in order to get into agreement, we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit used because they're for the purpose of building up the body, right? Yes, I hope you understand that. They're not for competition. They're not for show. They're for the purpose of building up the body. So we have this three-part harmony of his word, his will, and then agreement together. Number two, how does agreement, why does agreement in prayer seem so difficult? You ever thought about that? Why does getting into agreement seem so difficult? Why do we have to argue about things? Why can't we just agree? <laughs> Because it's in human nature. You see, a human nature is basically, let's disagree before we agree. How did that start? It started way back in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve were deceived by the serpent. And at that point, communication with God suddenly got all fouled up. It got wrecked. We, we don't know each other's heart anymore. Because they got deceived and they left God's clear understanding of what he wanted for their life, and they wanted for each other. And so at that point, they got into disagreement with God. We call it sin, but really, they were in disagreement with God. And as a result of that, they got in disagreement with one another. I mean, immediately, what happened? God said, what happened? What went wrong? Why are you hiding? And they said, well, because we're naked. And he said, well, who, who said you were naked? And suddenly they're just in this disagreement. And obviously they didn't have clothes on, but there was also something inside that got exposed as well. Because originally there was no separation between the natural and the spiritual with Adam and Eve. But suddenly after their disobedience, then there became a separation between the spiritual and the natural. And thank God for Jesus that he restored the two. We'll get to that in a few moments. And so we find here that uh, in, in that that one moment as sin entered, we also find disagreement with God entered. And that just, that just grew in mankind all the way down through history until Jesus came on the scene. I call it the agreement collision. <laughs> the agreement collision. I mean, just communication was wrecked, disagreement entered in, agreement went out the window, and now mankind is in a mess. But praise God, we didn't stay there right away. Jesus, uh, uh, where, where Satan said, gotcha, Jesus, God stepped up and said, no, you don't. And immediately, right after that, he proclaimed that Jesus would come. And uh, as uh, Jesus comes, I call that the agreement collaboration. The agreement collaboration, where we come back into agreement with God. A couple of verses here I want to just uh, bring to your attention. The first is 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Let me put my translation to it. As in Adam, we all come into disagreement with God, but in Christ, we were all made to agree with God. Let's continue. In uh, verse 45 of that same chapter, 15 to 48, so it is written, the first Adam... The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, referring to Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of dust of the earth. The second man of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those that are of earth. 
And as the heavenly man, so also those are of heaven. Just as we have bore the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. So we see here in this, uh, this scripture how, uh, again, Adam and Eve were in, in the natural, the spiritual, were joined together after they disagreed with God, they sinned. Then it got separated, and in Jesus Christ, it was brought back together. Hallelujah. And so Jesus is the one that brought us back into agreement with God. Let me finish up here, number two, with Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and uh, through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with grace and with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What an amazing scripture. That when we find ourselves in disagreement with God, thinking to ourselves that nobody else uh, ever cares, we can trust the fact that Jesus Christ has that same temptation. And yet, he didn't give in. He overcame. So that should give us hope that we can overcome. When we're in a situation of disagreement with people, to always have hope, it's possible with Jesus in the middle of this, that we can overcome, that we can get into agreement, first of all, with his will, second of all, with his word, and finally, with those around us. And we have to establish what his will is in order to, and sometimes we find that by reading his word, and then also in conversation with other people through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we then come into agreement together. And Jesus Christ did that for us. Hallelujah. Number three. Coming into agreement with God's will for answered prayer. How do we do that? And here's what we find. In Mark 11:24, it says, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. Wow, that's a pretty straightforward statement, isn't it? It says that ask for and believe it, and it will be yours. Now, people have taken that, and they've made it into kind of a blanket statement that you can say whatever you want to, and God will give it to you. Well, again, uh, that's not exactly the case, because we have to line up with God's will. We have to line up with his word, and then when those two are in agreement with together, then we can say, and God says he, that we will answer the prayer of agreement. Now, just prior to this verse that I just read, it said that if you believe in your heart and do not doubt. So obviously, if you're doubting and you pray, that's not a great position to be in. You have to recognize that, no, I have to find God's will so I don't doubt what God's will is and then begin to pray that and come into agreement with others. And then God says that he delights in answering that kind of prayer. My wife has a car that uh, occasionally she lets me drive. And when I get into it, one of the first things that happens is I turn on the ignition and there's this little light that comes up in the dashboard. It says systems check. And it goes through about 30 seconds of, uh, of all through. I don't know where it goes when it does its systems check. But I'm always happy when it comes back and says we're all good. <laughs> because that means that the car is ready to, to go forward and to do what it's designed and intended to do after it's done, went through that systems check. So I want to give you a, a four systems check that you can use to get into agreement with God this morning. And the first one is this, is that we have to have a heart check. We have to have a heart check. And the question is, is my conscience clear about this matter? Is my conscience clear about this matter? David wrote in Psalm 66, 18 through 20, he said, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. 
But God has surely listened, and he has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. David recognized that if he had cherished sin in his heart, God would not have listened to his prayer. He would, God was not in agreement because David was cherishing sin in his heart. And, and, and that's something that we individually take care of. We individually. David prayed another prayer in the end of Psalm 39. Search me, O God, and know if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. David did that. He took the initiative with God to say, search me. And so we get to do that. We get to do a systems check in our heart and see if there's anything within us that God would say, take care of this. One of the, I was uh, with a pastor, this is years ago, and uh, he said that they were getting ready to pray for a lady that was sick, and, and uh, the person that was orchestrating everything, it was a group of pastors going in to pray for somebody. And she said, now before you go in there and pray for her, you sit down here with a card, and you make your sin list, and confess before God, and then we can go in and pray. And he's like, what? He said, I didn't think I had anything. But he said, I was just obedient to what they wanted to do. I sat down in the chair, and I got, a little, I got out my little paper, and he said, what do you know? <laughs> sure enough, I had three or four things in there that God and I took care of before we went in to pray for that lady. So things crop up, you know? They just crop up. Not that we're looking, but sometimes if we want to get into agreement with God and with one another, we've got to do a heart check. James cites that as well. In chapter 4, verse 3, he says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. It's like, will God answer a prayer just to make it convenient for us? No. I had someone come to me and they said, I want you to pray for my wife that has risk problems, but also uh, I'm asking that... Uh, that God heal her after we collect the insurance money <laughs> on, on her wrist. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm sure God said the same. So we have to have the right motives. Here's the second check. We need to, we need to have a head check. I'm not talking about lice either. We need to have a head check. In uh, first, um, or second Corinthians, rather, uh, chapter 10, verse 5, Paul says this. He says, We demolish every stronghold and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. This head check is simply this. Is my mind staying on Jesus and his word? As I'm coming into agreement with what he wants. Is my mind staying on Christ? Or is my mind on the offense? Is my mind on how much that person hurt me? Is my mind on how inconvenient this is? Is my mind on what's going wrong rather than coming to God to say, what can go right here? And so it's a check. It's a systems check that we have to go through in order to, uh, to make sure that we're clear so that God will answer the prayer of agreement. And then uh, again in uh, uh, Corinthians, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Wow, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And then a few verses later he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Isn't that an amazing statement? That we have access to the mind of Jesus through the Holy Spirit? That to me is astounding. But that's reality. That we can actually know the revelation of Jesus. We can know the wisdom of Jesus. We can know the perseverance of Jesus. We can know the endurance of Jesus. We can know when we need to stand up and when we need to keep our mouth shut according to the mind of Christ. We have access to the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit in order to come into agreement with God. That's powerful. And so we need to do a head check. And then uh, the third check that we need is a harmony check. We have a heart check, a head check, and then we need to do a harmony check. And that is, are we in agreement with other people around us that are praying about the same thing? 
In Acts chapter 1, verse 24, they were praying to replace uh, the, uh, Judas that had taken his life, and they were bringing on a 12th apostle because that's what the Scripture says, says do. And this is what they said in uh, Acts 1, 24. It says, they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen. So they came and they, they yielded to God, but they were all in agreement about that. Then later in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, it says, When they heard this, they, um, when they, heard this, they raised their voice together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you have made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. What, what, what was happening there that they, they, they had such unity in prayer? They were being persecuted for their faith. And as a result of that, they stood their ground. They persevered over, over what the, the rulers of the day said to do, and they were all in unity together. Then later on that chapter in Acts 4, 31 and 32, it says, After they prayed, the place where they were was shaken. The meeting where they were was shaken. I don't know what that looked like. Whether, I, I mean, whether the building was shaking, I'd call that an earthquake. <laughs> I'd run out. Whether the people were shaking, whether the chairs were shaking, I don't know what was shaken. It says the meeting was shaken. And as a result of God coming in that way, because they were in agreement together, then it says all the believers were one in heart and in mind. No one claimed any of their possessions as their own, and they shared everything they had. Wow, what an amazing church to be a part of. It's because they were in agreement together and they prayed and God came and he answered. So that's the harmony check together. I was uh, having lunch with uh, one of the folks here and he was telling me about uh, being at a, another church that he attended and he got the opportunity to pray with uh, the leaders of that church. And so uh, I don't know how long it was, but they were praying. And one day it came up that one of the leaders had a serious health issue and was headed to the doctor. And so uh, the guy I was talking with, he said, so I decided that the scripture says we should pray for the sick and, and the prayer of faith and believe for healing. So he suggested to the leaders, why don't we pray for this person? And they all kind of looked at him like he's from outer space. And he's like, well, I will. And so he gets up and places his hand on the individual and begins to pray the prayer of faith for, for healing. And, and nobody else joined him and nobody else prayed. And after that experience, he decided, I'm not in harmony with this church. <laughs> I'm going to find a place that I'm in harmony with in this regard. And so, you know, sometimes you go through things and you find out, I'm not in harmony with these people. And sometimes that takes a while. And uh, then you have to decide whether or not God is asking you to stay and influence them or where he's asking you to lead, uh, leave, and really it depends um, on a lot of different factors, um, hopefully not core doctrine. Sometimes it can be depend upon opinion. And uh, yeah, that's a whole other sermon, so we'll leave that one for another time. You get my point. The last is a hand check. Put a whole bunch of teenagers in a room and turn out the light. You got to turn on the light for a hand check, right? No, we need a hand check. What does that mean? It means that will we take action... Okay, will we take action after we've prayed? Will we be obedient to what the Lord says? That's the question. In uh, James 2, he talks about Abraham. Let me read, uh, first of all, uh, the, the action of obedience. James 2, 18 says this. Hey, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. And then he goes on later on in verse 21, he says... Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for which he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled and says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteous. And he was called God's friend. You see, a person is considered righteous by what they do, not by faith alone. So the hand check that we need when, when we're, we're praying together to get in agreement with God is when he speaks, are we willing to take the action that he says do? 
Or are we willing to not know God? I, wanna, don't, I don't want to do that. Because sometimes, you know, we think we're waiting on God to do something. He says, no, I'm waiting on you. I, I've told you what to do. I'm waiting on you. Oh, oh, God, show me what to No, I'm waiting on you. And God doesn't change his story. Sometimes we dance around because we don't want to do what he's called us to do. We don't want to take the action to stay in agreement with him. But if we don't take the action, then we're not in agreement with him. We may have gone through the heart check and the head check and the harmony check, but if we don't do the hand check and willing to take the action that God says do, Megan opened up the service this morning and said that, you know, God spoke to her about that, the simple verse in Proverbs where it says, make your plans, but let God determine your steps. And she realized she hadn't made any plans, but she was expecting God to determine her steps. God says, no, 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 it starts here. Make your plans. Understand my will. Understand my word. Get in agreement with those around you. Make your plans. And then let me determine your steps. That's the way it works. And so we have to come into agreement that way. Well, maybe you realize today that you're out of agreement in something. Hopefully the systems check can help you. That you realize, wow, I need to come and just come before God and ask him, is, are we okay? Is my conscience clear? Is there anything that I need to take care of between you and I, just as individuals? And let God speak. He's a loving father. He doesn't want to keep separation from you and him. That's not his goal. That's not his desire. He wants you to be close. Abraham was called a friend of God. And we can be a friend of God. In fact, he calls us a friend of God. And in uh, John chapter 15, he calls us friends. And so we have to be willing to, to make that heart check. And if it's good, it comes out, systems go, then we go to the next one and say, okay, now, uh, now we need to do a head check. What am I believing about this? Am I believing that God wants to take all things and turn it around for good for those who are called according to his purpose? Do I really believe that? Things are in a mess they're going the other way. Even our nation sometimes, and we've had some amazing rulings from the Supreme Court here recently and we praise God for, and yet the nation is still in a mess. And we think to ourselves, how, God, are you going to turn it around? And yet the Word says that He, when we honor Him, He can turn everything around and take our messes and make them into to incredible presentations of testimonies of God's goodness. Do we believe that? We can lose you know, we, can, we can lose belief. Jesus said the work of God is to believe. We have to work at it at times. It doesn't come easy because of our human nature. So maybe you're at the place of needing to do a head check. You realize, wow, maybe I am not believing what, what God really says I should believe. Maybe I need to do a head check. Maybe I need to do a study. Maybe I need to be the first in line for Wanda's book so I can figure out the topics and what God's will is. And then we need to do a harmony check. When we ask people to pray for us, what's the agenda behind that? Is the agenda that we would get our prayer answered for our own convenience or is the agenda that God would be glorified? And we go back and do a heart check again because our agenda is wrong. But harmony with people is important. Jesus recognized that it's not about you and I. It's about others around us. It might be two or three or, or four or seven or 7,000. But he says, come into agreement and I will answer the prayer. I'll shake the meeting that you're in when you come into agreement. And then finally, the hand check. And that is, are we willing? Maybe there's something you already went through the other three and you're stuck on the hand check. <laughs> you're like, God, I don't want to do that. God, I don't want to. You've spoken clearly, you made it clear, but I, I'm, I'm not ready to go there. I'm not ready to. Man, again, if you want to get in agreement with God, you have to go all the way. You have to go through all checks. All, all of them. But let me just encourage you today to say this. And that is that God's a loving Father. And He, he is, is, is so passionate about where you're at. And uh, He can empower you to get over you. <laughs> he can empower you to get over you. In a few moments, we're, we're going to uh, have some folks that... Uh, will be available to pray with you. I want to encourage you that if you're going through one of these checks and, and, you, and you stopped and, and, the, and the red light's going off, going, yeah, 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 you know, get that one checked, then come on up and, 
and get it fixed. Jesus is a great mechanic. I mean, he knows exactly, precisely where to, to unlock that which is broken. In the first service, we had a word of knowledge of someone with an uh, eating disorder. I don't know. I'll just share that in a second, that God wants to heal you. And I recognize that if you do have an eating disorder, that it relates to, uh, there's also a thinking disorder. Because eating disorders relate to thinking disorders. And, and God wants to do a head check with you to straighten out your thinking so your eating disorder can be healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to spend some time to what it means to come in agreement with you because you do answer the prayer of agreement. You are the one that delights in bringing heaven to earth. Jesus, you told us to pray. May it be done on earth, in earth, in your life. May it be done on earth as it is in heaven, God. You would delight to have this, this, uh, this uh, uh, communication you would, you would delight in having it so clear and, and so quick and so precise that there wouldn't be delay, God. You would delight in that, Lord. And yet we live in a world and time and all the things that we've accumulated in life. Lord, we struggle to come into agreement. God, help us be more aware that you delight in answering the prayer of agreement. And Lord, I, I pray that as we understand this to a, a fuller dimension, that we will see more and more and more and more answers to prayer. So thank you, Father, for letting us look in the mirror this morning so that we can see reality. But then when we look in the mirror, we also see you. We see Jesus. We see what he accomplished for us. We see what he accomplished as us because he became a man and lived among us. And we're grateful, Lord, that we have all the tools that we need all the power we need, all the ability that we need in order to win in the end. God, help us to come into agreement with you, with your will, your word, with one another, and to do what you say do. In Jesus' name, amen.